On No Going Back, we followed the fortunes of this man, who turned his back on the northern club circuit for an idyllic olive farm in Tuscany. Richard Turnbull, his wife Sarah and their three-year-old son Gregory left Yorkshire behind in search of the good life, harvesting vegetables, making cider oh, that's it. and pressing their own olive oil. But they'd never farmed before and didn't speak the language. Oh my God! I there was no hot running water and the only lavatory was an organic sawdust toilet. It's actually a, um, a poo with a view. Now, almost a year on, we follow their struggle to survive as the reality of their Tuscan dream kicks in. They're desperate for their new holiday business to be a success, but there's tough deadlines to meet and the pressure's on. Oh, we it's not high enough! What are you like? Being their own landlords turns into a nightmare. Sorry it's not turned out to be as you wanted and well, apologise well, for well, the Tuscan weather. Cup of tea, but... To bring in more vital cash, they have to expand the farm, but they still can't manage to make ends meet. Never goes smoothly, does it? And keeping the business afloat pushes Richard and Sarah's relationship to the limit. Two years ago, Richard and Sarah decided they wanted to trade the blustery English winds for endless Italian skies. Months of internet surfing later, they found what they were looking for, a 200-year-old Tuscan farmhouse. As soon as I saw it, it just felt right. It was an incredible feeling that I did actually really fall in love with this place. Springtime in Tuscany. Richard and Sarah travelled to Italy to meet the owner and clinch the deal on their dream home. <laughs> their lead semi went for £120,000. For the same money, they acquired an 18th century farmhouse with a 15 acre estate to the west of Florence. The house stands on a hill overlooking steeply terraced olive groves with spectacular views of the valley and the hills beyond. It's good soil. In season, the fruit trees are heavy with cherries, kiwi and apricots. It is paradise, isn't it? It's, it's better than I remember it, which is saying something because I thought it was perfect to start with. The aim was to live off the land, but there was also cash to be made. They were hoping that the harvest from their 350 olive trees would yield a valuable quantity of extra virgin olive oil. It's going to be the best olive harvest we've ever had. It will be the best <laughs> olive harvest we've ever had. Yorkshire, two weeks before Richard and Sarah left for their new life in Tuscany. They wound up the mobile disco company that, for the past five years, they'd ran from their house. The unsociable hours and punishing workload left little time for family life. A three-year-old and a working office is not, it doesn't really doesn't mix at all. Very hard work. I won't miss having to be in the office, I won't miss having to answer the phone, I won't miss having to deal with tedious, boring queries. No, just I'm so not going to miss it. <laughs> While Sarah ran the office, Richard was out on the road as Yorkshire's top Jimmy Savile impersonator. I have to say that at this moment in time, that glass of wine in Italy does seem a long way away. <laughs> I think the big thing about moving to Italy is getting off the merry-go-round, getting away from running to keep up and then just taking the time to, uh, to enjoy you know, what we've got. Now the lots of noise this evening for Sir Jim. Yay! Jesus. But it was the end of the road for Sir Jim. The turntables, shell suits, nylon wigs and big cigars were put into storage and the disco trailer was recommissioned for the long haul to the sun. Friends and neighbours gathered round to help squeeze in as many of life's essentials as it could hold. Well, I brought you a card. Thank you, darling. And I just want 
Ich schon ein bisschen auf mich zu Ah. Oh, we've done some dancing, haven't we? <laughs> we just, yeah. <laughs> See you over there, won't we? Yeah, we will. Ahead of them was a two-day journey by road and a brand new life in Italy. Richard and Sarah's new front drive was a steep, winding dirt track. The bends were too sharp for the van and trailer. Fortunately, Christian, the former owner, was on hand with his tractor. It's a remote setting. The nearest neighbor is more than a mile away. The nearest town, six miles. Patia hasn't changed much since the Renaissance. It's a sleepy town of cobbled squares, shuttered windows, and classic Italian churches. The house itself is a two-story traditional Tuscan farmhouse with oak-beamed kitchen, wood-burning stove, sitting room with open hearth, and three bedrooms, all with views of the valley. To wake up to this in the morning, you, uh, you really can't put a price on that, can you? All you can hear is birds singing, just a million, million miles away from, uh, from what we've left behind. Back in Leeds, three-year-old Gregory had played on a scrap of back lawn. Now he had 15 acres to call home. Do you like it here? Let's go home. This is home, isn't it? It's nice. The hurried sandwich eaten on the run was swapped for long, lazy lunches, washed down with a couple of glasses of Chianti. And bath time became a relaxed evening ritual, watching the sun go down. It's been fantastic. It's a result to be outside and Gregory running around you know, like a little sand boy. He's just he couldn't be happier. Let's go. See Mummy and tell her all about your bath. The first few days were idyllic, but there were a few minor drawbacks. There was no central heating, no hot water, and instead of a bathroom, some dubious alfresco arrangements. The toilet, a bucket in the shed, required nerves of steel and a plentiful supply of sawdust. The point with the, um, the toilet now is that you don't go unless you really, really need to. It's not great. Really, I do like to flush. <laughs> I certainly won't like it when I've got to empty it. I really won't like that. That's, in fact, I'm not going to do that. That unsavoury task fell to Richard. 30 yards down the hill was a waste pit. Richard and Sarah had left England with 5,000 pounds savings. They worked out that to survive, they'd need a yearly income of 12,000 pounds. Their ambitious plan was to convert half the farmhouse and an old disused chestnut barn on the terraces into holiday accommodation. Fully booked, the rent from these holiday lets would bring in £9,000. A successful olive harvest could net them another £3,000 from the oil when pressed in November. The farm work had to start immediately. The most urgent priority was to clear the 50 terraces overgrown with tall weeds and grasses. In the flaming summer months ahead, these could present a severe fire hazard potentially destroying their most precious crop, the 350 olive trees. We have got a tremendous amount still to do. Uh, a section of terrace like this, you can do about four steps in the morning before you physically can't do any more. Next on the list was planting vegetables. Sarah had earmarked a prime spot on the lower terraces for an 80-foot-long vegetable patch. She'd never gardened on this scale before, 
and had set herself the ambitious task of growing all the family's vegetables. Unfortunately, I'm not entirely sure what lettuce looks like when it comes up in seedling form, so what I have to do is not weed <laughs> until it's recognisable, because otherwise I'll just be pulling the wrong stuff up. And I suppose that's what the problem with being a uh, novice is that you, uh, you're not entirely sure which is what. <laughs> But Sarah had big plans for her garden. She wanted to say goodbye to supermarket produce and grow as much as she could for the family herself. Buying seedlings for her garden, though, meant negotiating with the locals on market day. She relied on the traditional English props, sign language and a phrase book. Beans. Because I can't speak Italian, it really, really frustrates me because I feel like I'm ignorant and knew if I really pulled my finger out, I'd get to grips with it. I feel like a complete fool. Richard and Sarah soon realised that to survive in Tuscany, they'd need more than a smattering of Italian. Ciao, Sylvia! Ciao. Sarah and Richard! <laughs> they decided to take lessons from a local tutor. Io metto il giacchetto Gregory. Ah, sì. I bambino, bambino. Lo stesso. It's the same. Bimbo is uh, <laughs> the short form. In Tuscany is bimbo. Ah. Piangere. 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 Buono. <laughs> Molto buono. Molto buono. <laughs> Buonissimo. <laughs> Richard and Sarah were just four weeks into their new life. They traded in DJing in Yorkshire for a Tuscan hillside. But high summer was on its way, and they would have to work the land during one of the hottest months in 50 years. And, desperate to get their holiday let's business up and running, they had to face some disheartening news from their Italian builders. Phew. Cold, damp English summers had been traded in for hot days working in the Tuscan sun. But Richard and Sarah had never reckoned on heat like this. Temperatures soared into the 40s, the hottest for 50 years. It was enough to make an English rose wilt. There wasn't any slow movement into hot weather. It was just one day it was cool and the next evening it was intolerably hot. It's annoying because although you want to get lots and lots done, you just you can't because it, it's you've got a window of maybe two hours in the morning when it's cold enough to work outside and then you've had it. In the incapacitating heat, Mediterranean style siestas were no longer a luxury, they became essential. Happily, the resourceful Richard came up with an idea that would give them immediate relief right on their doorstep. His inspiration, a couple of old olive buckets. It's going to be a bit of a, like a Californian style um, jacuzzi, but without the bubbles and not in California. I could do this for a living. Absolutely level. This is heaven. It is absolute bliss. But there was no time for Richard to rest on his laurels. Another project needed his attention. 
he and Sarah had earmarked their £5,000 savings for the conversion of half the farmhouse and the small disused chestnut barn into accommodation for paying guests. The first step was to get the builders in to assess the cost of the operation. And Richard was taking no risks with the language. Being totally at sea with Italian builder speak, he asked Christian, the former owner, to act as interpreter. They do tend to go at 100 miles an hour and there's a lot of uh, huffing and puffing goes on. I'd rather not know all that actually, I'd rather just know at the end of the day, yes you can do it, no you can't do it, and, uh, and what we can do to help. It was bad news for Richard and Sarah. The builders had discovered damp, rotting mortar and gaping holes in the roof of the farmhouse. Everything needed underpinning and the bare earth floor would have to be excavated before pipes could be laid. The builders estimated the total cost of the job to be £10,000, 5000 more than Richard and Sarah had to spend. Without the conversion, there would be no holiday lets to make up the bulk of their income, so Richard decided to take on the first stage, digging out the farmhouse floor himself, saving them a vital £2,000. It's really starting from scratch to get this all dug out and then the builders when they come can just get on with building that they can get the, the plumbing in, get everything done. So it's, nothing, nothing can happen until this is dug out. Although Richard was making progress, because of limited funds the rest of the renovation work had to be put on hold and the lack of amenities started to get to Sarah. I'd rather like a bathroom now. I'm sick of being on my bloody knees, staking a stupid wood-burning boiler that's about 300 years old. Please, just... If it wasn't good enough for Sarah, it certainly wasn't going to be good enough for prospective guests. For the family to survive in Tuscany, the holiday-let conversions had to be ready in time for the tourist season the following spring. But with the building work on hold, due to a dire lack of funds, an urgent cash injection was required. There was only one thing to do. Richard had to go back to England to earn the money, leaving Sarah and Gregory alone on the farm. It's a big wrench to have to do it, but, you know, short-term pain for long-term gain. You gorgeous little man, aren't you? No, I'm not. Hey, do you know what you've got to do when I'm not here? Look after mummy. It was a tough decision, but after flights and accommodation, Richard could bring home five hundred pounds a week. So he dusted down the turntables and got the nylon wig out of mothballs. By day, he was Jimmy Savile. Now then, now then, now then. Oh. <laughs> By night, it was the disco circuit. Without doing this, we couldn't be in Italy. You, you feel like you're stopping and starting in work-wise things that we're trying to do in, Italy, but also kind of stopping and starting in your relationship almost, you know, because I've got to come away, there's a physical gap and you know, an emotional gap. It isn't nice for Sarah, it certainly isn't nice for Gregory. While Richard was away, Sarah threw herself into her gardening, ensuring that the family's future food supply was properly tended to. Every day, without fail, I come down into the garden and check everything. <laughs> I know where every fruit is, I know where every seed should be. You invest such a lot of time and effort worrying about it and, you know, babying the whole garden. But her vigilance wasn't enough. Alone on the farm, Sarah came under siege. The potato patch had been savaged by some stripy invaders. Such ugly bugs. They're eating everything. Here, everything's different, everything looks different, and in general, everything's much bigger as well. I don't know what he is. I'm going to find out, though. 
Rapid response was called for, otherwise the entire crop, the results of months of hard work, could be lost. Here we go. The, what it's coming back to is Colorado beetle. And there you go. Great big picture of what we've got. Potato bug. So we need to get rid of it, basically, otherwise it's going to eat everything. So how do I do that? Inspect plants once or twice a week, remove all larvae and adult beetles, drop them in a container of soapy water, kill them. I really don't like doing this. Bug, meet thy maker. Yeah. So hard just with two hands. Oh, boom! <laughs> there are just billions of the wretched things. Are they disgusting? Yeah. Do you think you might want them for dinner? Yeah. Oh, no, that'd be too crunchy. After four weeks slaving over a hot turntable in Yorkshire, Richard finally returned to the farm at the end of the summer, and the family were reunited. <laughs> Oh, should we do that a bit later? Yeah. Quality time together was the order of the day. Good. This is the best pizza I've ever had. That's it. Feel it. Good boy. Whee! Together they took on new challenges, picking their first apples to make cider. That is the perfect apple. You ready? I'm ready. Oh, uh, wow. Okay, can I start for a second? Yeah. Right then. Oh, that's it. Oh, look at that flowing. That is beautiful. Pure golden Tuscan cider. The hot weather may not have done much for Richard and Sarah, but it did wonders for the vegetables. It was Sarah's first harvest. The courgettes, aubergines, tomatoes and peppers were plump and ready to pick. At the moment there's absolutely no way I'd go and buy any fruits or vegetables because we've just got so much here. And with the last of the summer berries, Sarah made jam. Everything that goes into my jam comes from our garden. My life has completely changed in almost every way. I wouldn't ever have had the chance to spend a whole day just cooking. And I do love it, I love cooking. But life on the farm was about to get tougher. The olives were ripening and Richard and Sarah would have to work against the clock hand-picking every one, a back-breaking 18 hours a day, or face losing the lot. I think we're in for a few nighttime sessions. Autumn. Richard and Sarah had been on their Tuscan farm for six months, but despite Richard's work stints back in the UK, they still needed more cash to kick-start the building work on their holiday accommodation. The olive harvest was just a week away and they were pinning their hopes on a bumper crop to raise the funds they so desperately needed. <laughs> Meanwhile, three-year-old Gregory took his first steps on the path from Yorkshireman to Little Italian, beginning with regular sessions at the local nursery. With Gregory happily ensconced at the local Lescuola, Richard and Sarah turned their attention to a new project. They always knew their ambitions for maximum self-sufficiency were not going to be satisfied by an unchanging diet of fruit and veg. They needed protein, and no farm would be complete without a steady supply of fresh eggs. Luciano, their nearest neighbour a mile across the valley, offered to get the fledgling chicken farmers started. Ciao, Luciano. Ciao. <laughs> the Rhode Island Red 
a prolific egg layer, robust and low maintenance. So how many do you want then, darling? Lots. <laughs> I don't know, as many Got. as I can have. Where's that Giovanni? Giovanni, see. Brava, no, no, Bellina. Our first, our first of many. Ah, oh, see. Oh, Ancora una. Oh, she squeaks, isn't she cute? You're gorgeous. Hello, sweetheart. Would you like to come and live with us? Due anni, tre anni mangiare. Si. Gallina la lessa, con ah, brodo. Con... Two, two or three years, Wait. she can give us eggs and then we'll eat her. That's our, that's our way of saying thank you. Do you understand? This is Chico Messi, same means. Luciano had other treats in store for Richard and Sarah. For the past 30 years, he's had a reputation for his top quality olive oil. Some of the best oil in the world comes from these Tuscan hills. Renowned for its fruity taste, it's considered the least fatty and most delicious in Italy. There's no comparison to shop. Mm, it's gorgeous, isn't it? No. Mm. Let's just hope that ours is, is as good as this. It is just beautiful. It's good, isn't it? Mm. Finito. <laughs> Last year's had been a vintage pressing. It was something for Richard and Sarah to aspire to. Harvest time. In the valley, the olive groves, silent places throughout the summer, now bustled with activity as the local farmers laid their nets in preparation for picking. On Richard and Sarah's farm, the months of Tuscan sun had transformed the olives from tiny buds, then bright green pebbles, to rich black berries, ripe and ready for harvest. The darker the olives, the more plentiful the oil. We woke up so early this we morning were. because we were just so excited. We were going, we can't get up yet, it's still dark. Today is a fabulous day, actually. It's a perfect olive picking day. Let's go do it then. Harvesting continues till early February. It's not a game, Tigger. But it was a race against time in the initial weeks to get the berries off the trees and away to the press. Richard and Sarah didn't have any machines, so the crop from their 350 trees all had to be picked by hand. Getting on with it, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling to be uh, finally in and amongst and uh, getting your hands on the little blighters. <laughs> it's great, actually. It's such a sense of um, achievement when you just even strip one section, just a branch of the tree. I like it already. They'd booked their first appointment at the pressing mill and had just five days to pick 350 kilos. If they couldn't make the weight, they'd be turned away. And once picked, olives can't be left to lie longer than a week, otherwise they begin to perish. Richard and Sarah weren't even sure whether it was physically possible for two people to pick 350 kilos in five days, but they were determined to try. Day three of the harvest, and Richard and Sarah were still well short of their target weight. So they turned up the pressure and started working through the night. Do you want to carry those branches round, Alan? That would be... Just to the front of the house? Yeah, on that net there. And pick them off. We need to get as many olives in as possible, and to stand any chance of getting them all in, we need to be putting the hours in. I think we're in for a few nighttime sessions. <laughs> One day before their pressing date, and they were still nowhere near the required weight. If they missed the deadline, all their hard work would go to waste, and they could lose a substantial amount of cash. Exhaustion took its toll. Panic set in, and tempers began to fray. I've done most of the nets today on my Whinge, own. whinge, whinge. Yeah, well, it's the crappiest job and you've given me it all. Yeah, no, you said you wanted to do it. Go and do something else if you don't like it. You said you were Mrs. Net, Miss Bloody Master. Richard and Sarah were desperate. They sent out a distress call to neighbours and friends who rallied round. What are you doing up there? Charlie, 
Ciao. Ciao, Sarah. This morning we realised that if we, if we don't really, really get our skates on, we're not going to have enough. It's a bit of a godsend, really. The living room floor was eventually covered with olives ready for the press. Everything that we've got here is what we've picked in the last five days. So we've got a rough idea. We're estimated about 300 kilograms, so we'll see how close to that we are. It seems an awful lot of olives, but it doesn't seem a lot for 12 hours a day for five days. <laughs> At this time of the year, the pressing mill becomes the focus of village life. For Richard and Sarah's precious hand-picked crop, it was way in time and the moment of truth. 393 kilograms. <laughs> The blood, sweat and tears had paid off. The yield from their first five days picking was 43 kilos over the minimum weight required by the mill. Critical eye. Did you see that? The critical eye there. Uh -oh. Any English picked olives those. I'm going to move. Sarah and Richard's olives were de-leaved, washed and, with pits intact, crushed by a stone grinder. A hydraulic press then extracted the oil. The culmination of our hard work is about to come out of that tube. While a lighter colour liquid signals a nutty taste, a more intense hue, like Richard and Sarah's, indicates a full fruity flavour. Oh, that is, that is good. One up. Yeah. We did it, Pico. You did that. You made that. And the official verdict from the mill backed up the taste test. Fine quality merchandise with a high ratio of oil per olive. Their very first pressing was a huge success. 50 litres of olive oil worth about 250 pounds. If Richard and Sarah could just keep it up over the remaining 11 weeks of the harvest, then finally they would have enough money to get the builders in. The first of many. Our virgin, virgin olive. Winter was a long, hard slog for Richard and Sarah. There was still the endless days toiling in the olive groves to complete the harvest. And Richard continued working the turntables back in Yorkshire in an effort to raise yet more cash. The family managed to get through the coldest months without the luxury of central heating, and Sarah carried on her struggles with the wood-fired boiler. The kitchen became a makeshift bathroom and there was always the challenge of trips to the toilet down in the garden. But Sarah had made the most of their bountiful harvest, pickling, bottling and preserving her hoard of fruit and veg. And the chickens made their first contribution to the household pantry. Look, what? Look, you can pick up eggs. You can have these for your tea. On his return from working the decks back in the UK, Richard put in long, hard hours digging out the farmhouse floor. But after the best part of a year, the make-or-break test of whether Richard and Sarah can sustain their Tuscan dream is yet to come. The holiday lets have to be completed by spring if they're to generate enough income for the coming year. And not everything's going according to plan. Richard's to come in drenched, covered in water. Water's going everywhere. Springtime in Italy. Richard and Sarah have been relishing the tranquility of their Tuscan farmhouse for nearly a year. But now Casa del Sole has turned into a construction site. Richard's DJing stints have paid off and with enough cash they've finally been able to give the builders the go-ahead. There's no more trips back to the UK for Richard. He needs to be on site full time to ensure that the workmen get the guest accommodation ready for the start of the tourist season. However, little progress has been made on the land. 
The winter months have left Sarah's vegetable garden overgrown and neglected. The spring seedlings are still waiting to be planted and the fruit trees need pruning. But Sarah is preoccupied with another growing concern. Back in December when Richard was on the road in Yorkshire, Sarah discovered she was pregnant. I found out that Sarah was pregnant, having been in England for sort of two weeks before Christmas, working all day, every day for two weeks, came back absolutely shattered. He had no idea. He was just so tired, he wasn't picking up any of the vibes that I was sending out. So eventually I gave him his Christmas present early on Christmas Eve. And it's a book for uh, babies, um, like baby's first year book, she gave him this, this book. Uh, and I'm thinking, it's a bit late, he's three and a half now. <laughs> and then it was really comical, it slowly dawned on him, goes, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, yep. So it's quite nice, really, it's quite romantic. Now five months pregnant, Sarah is getting worried about the birth. Complications when Gregory was born meant that she had to have an emergency caesarean. Understandably, the prospect of having to deal with both the pain barrier and the language barrier is a bit daunting. When it's really important, like in a medical situation, that you're understood completely, it's really hard. Nevertheless, a return to England is out of the question. Sarah is determined that this should be an Italian job. I so don't want to go back to England. I don't want to leave Gregory. I don't feel like I'd be going home to have the baby. I feel like I'd be leaving home to have the baby, which isn't the best, is it? No. But all these concerns could be academic if the cash flow doesn't improve. Sarah and Richard's continuing survival in Tuscany depends on having paying guests throughout the summer months. The renovation work is costing far more than they'd imagined, and they've had to take out a £10,000 loan to complete the work. They're up against the clock, too. They want to be open for business by Easter, just three weeks away. We scramble to get somewhere just by our fingertips, and we, we, you know, we get to that level just now we're by our fingertips trying to improve this property. Uh, you know, and get it really super duper with new windows, bathrooms, everything beautiful. And then when we get to that next level, there'll be something else above that. The plan is to turn one half of the farmhouse into a two bedroom holiday retreat and to convert the small disused chestnut barn set among the olive terraces into a rustic hideaway. To repay the money they borrowed and have enough left over to see them through the winter, Richard and Sarah need both properties fully booked throughout the summer. They've splashed out on a website, gambling scarce resources in the hope of drumming up bookings. It's all self-catering, so we're not providing them with supper or breakfast or anything like that. No, no. And the farmhouse has two double beds and three single beds. The chestnut house is teeny weeny insy. Very cute, um, and that just has one double bed in there. There's still a lot to be done before they're ready to receive any guests. The work on the farmhouse is nearly finished, but they've barely started on the chestnut house. The builders actually turned up the beginning of February, and they have done so much in, in a sort of six week, two month time scale, uh, time span, they've really done a phenomenal amount of work. Chief among the hod-carrying superheroes is Dante, who, on a tight budget and an even tighter timescale, has flown in the face of all preconceptions about Mediterranean builders. He's on time, on budget, on the ball. Dante is, is a god to us. We worship the ground he walks on, because most of it he's paved anyway. <laughs> and he's become a family friend in the process. Against all the odds, Richard and Sarah's ramshackle farmhouse is shaping up as an attractive holiday home and potentially a nice little earner. This will be the main bedroom, uh, main family room, so this was the first one to get finished, so uh, we're quite pleased we can shut the door on at least one of them now, so this is ready for guests to arrive, which is fantastic. They've put in a brand new central heating system at a cost of £6,000 and, a long overdue luxury, proper plumbing. But the kitchen's only a kitchen in theory. 
Richard's given the room a basic DIY facelift, but it can't function until £2,000 worth of white goods come rumbling up the hill. In a house without TV, the cooker turns out to be the best entertainment they've seen for a long time. Richard is in danger of becoming overexcited. See that off. Now that's good. Sarah doesn't know that he does this. Well, I didn't know that it was for uh, doing the going round thing. And it's brilliant. He plays it cool, letting Sarah discover the highlights of the show for herself. Oh my God, does it do rotisserie? <laughs> Not only does it do rotisserie, my oh dear. My God. You does put it... the light on. Oh. Watch those babies fly. Oh, we've got to get some chickens. I know where there are some. <laughs> <laughs> but the jewel in the crown, after months of sawdust and buckets, is the new bathroom. It's clean, it's indoors, it's the best £3,000 they've ever spent. This is our new bathroom. <laughs> Very nearly finished, and that is our new toilet. Unfortunately, at the moment, Gregory is a little bit scared of the whole flushing toilet thing. So he stands over there and says, Mommy, flush! <laughs> so I have to flush. However, the outdoor toilet hasn't been decommissioned yet because soon Richard, Sarah and Gregory will be forced to share their Tuscan paradise and surrender the renovated half of the farmhouse, complete with novelty oven and flushing loo, to guests. They will then have to decamp to the other side of the building, an altogether more ramshackle affair. This will be our bedroom, which has had nothing done to it and is as it was and as it will be for some time to come. This will be our living room. Um, <laughs> all this will be going, the old boiler. The day that we take that out will be a nice day to, uh, to see the back of that. Um, it hasn't been fun. <laughs> it has not been fun. The kitchen they'll be using hardly justifies the name. An old lean-to shed tacked on to the far side of the farmhouse with no walls and plastic sheeting for windows. It's entirely open to the elements. Originally, it would have been um, a, a storage either for storing animals or whatever, and we're actually using it as our kitchen upstairs. <laughs> it is very, very, uh, very, very ramshackled. That's not the worst of it. Once the guests are installed, pregnant Sarah will have to forego the joys of the new bathroom and return to using the outdoor amenities. I think when the first people come and we've got to move out, and we've kind of got used to it in here and it's nice. Uh, so, yeah, it will be a bit, uh, a bit of a step backwards for us. But with a £10,000 debt to pay off, they really have no alternative. There is some good news, though. Sarah's long hours responding to emails and marketing their Tuscan idyll have started to pay off. Casa del Sole has three bookings for Easter. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it'd be great because most of the people coming, especially in the farmhouse, have got children, so it'd be fantastic for Gregory. But things are never that simple. Their very first guests, two sisters, don't want to stay in the converted farmhouse at £500 a week. They've plumped for the £200 a week chestnut house, currently a two-storey shed with no bathroom, no kitchen and no stairs to access the bedroom. We've got three weeks until the first guests arrive. There's a lot of finishing off to do, but there's also a lot of stuff to start and do and finish off. So, yeah, it's, uh, we, we won't be sat down the day before sipping a glass of wine going, oh, I can't wait for them to get here. Having splashed out so extravagantly on fancy cookers and flushing toilets for the farmhouse, there's little left in the kitty for the chestnut house. Richard will have to do the bulk of the work himself, hiring casual labour on a daily basis, which means saying a reluctant arrivederci to Dante. Dante. Grazie. What? Let's get back in the Okay, you get one for you tomorrow. 
While contractors get busy with heavy diggers to clear rubble from the farmhouse site, Alfonso the plumber starts work on the bathroom for the chestnut house. Something more than the young Italian's pipe bending skills sends Sarah's hormones into overdrive. Alfonso, the plumber has arrived, the darling. The lad's got a golden glow. <laughs> he's, a, he's a babe. No time for that sort of thing. There's work to be done. Alfonso and Richard, two men, one mission. Dopo io metto staffe per scaldabagno. Ah, sì. Alfonso. Although Alfonso gains full marks for his endeavours, Richard's handiwork fails to impress Sarah's critical eye. That's not good enough. Someone will break it. I'm serious. Just Someone will open it. Wind will catch it or break it. You can't. Oh, you physically can't open it any further than that because the hinge is there. No, you don't open it further than that. But it's not me, is it? It's guests. Go and make a cup of tea. Don't mess about that. We haven't got time. With just days to go before the Chestnut House guests arrive, the pressure's on and the place is still a building site. It's the sort of time when a tiny setback could spell disaster. This is not a tiny setback. Richard's come in drenched, covered in water. Water's going everywhere. Last minute, no water in the house. Don't know what to do. I'm just going to eat some more cake. <laughs> The contractors with their diggers have cut straight through the mains water pipe which feeds both the farmhouse and chestnut house. Alfonso frantically tries to fix the burst main but fails. It's not his fault. Over the years the ancient pipe system has been patched and bodged. Yeah, the former owner, rather than buying a piece of tubing that would go from A to B, he'd get bits here and bits there. And so you've got this kind of thing going on a lot all over the place where big tubes went little tubes, Jubilee clips and what have you, and it's a pile of crap really. So uh, now we've got to find where the, all the rest of the joins are and you know, eventually put a proper, proper tube in, but not today, fortunately. To get the water supply reconnected, Alfonso will have to replace the entire pipe system. This will, of course, cost Richard and Sarah money and time, neither of which they have in plentiful supply. The big problem is that this is time that he should be spending getting the chestnut house ready for our guests in two days' time. That's the major thing that I'm worrying about, because <laughs> it ain't ready yet. <laughs> in two days' time, the first guests will walk up the hill with their suitcases. Neither of the holiday lets has running water. The chestnut house wouldn't accommodate even the most accommodating of guests. It looks as if Richard and Sarah's business could be scuppered before it's even launched. While Alfonso heroically attempts to fix the water supply, the pressure's on for Richard and Sarah to be ready in time for their first guests and their lack of experience in the holiday hospitality trade starts to show. I'll ask people for a bloody passport photograph next time, shall Just I? Just a name would be good. Well, I could find it out for you if you had... And the drama continues tomorrow at five. Next up, Zara's about to impress on Lee in Hollyoaks. It's a double bill coming up. <laughs>